Hi, welcome to uh, the fifth uh, of our Ask Us Anything sessions. Um, uh, Google Hangout, which we then archive on YouTube, uh, inviting all our industry colleagues in film and TV, uh, the technical side of the industry uh, here in London and, and further afield, as we'll find out in a minute, to ask us anything. Uh, we talk about um, workflow issues, um, technology, infrastructure issues, and I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by my good colleague Matt Ward, also in the Systems Integration Department, and just sitting right next door to me in the other room of the Route 6 workshop. Matt, how are you doing? No. And then over in what looks like his um, uh, beautiful commuter belt boudoir, Mr. Skeggs. <laughs> Good morning, yes. Fresh. I'm watching the sunshine and the birds. <laughs> Out of London. Uh, but you've, you've been up to Glasgow, haven't you? You're right, pal. You're right, wee man. I have. I've just come back fresh from fresh off the train. It so what, took a, lot time, a long time coming back. Going was a lot quicker. What, what, what was going down in Glasgow town? Uh, it was set up for the uh, Commonwealth Games on behalf of the BBC or BBC Sport. We're up there setting up some uh, ingest kit and their um, editing uh, facility, I guess. Jolly good. And, and, and right at the end of the, uh, of, of the line there, uh, Mr. Bill Baker in the um, Route 6 Development Department. It looks like you're in the dev team's office or the little back training room that I sometimes use there. Little back, our little hostage room in the back, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what are you going to chat to us today about, Bill? So we were uh, at the, in the DPP Manufacturers Interoperability Day, um, the, fir the last one actually before Far Delivery D-Day on the 1st of October. So I'll sort of go into a bit of that what we got up to, what came to light, and where, where we're going, and what what the situation looks like before the first of October. So, a bit of background. Obviously, um, uh, Route Six Manufacturer Content Agent, which is our transcoding um, media ingest pl sort of platform, um, and obviously October and and DPP is very important for us. Um, uh, do, you, do you want to give us a bit of background on all of that, and, and, and what what's what's tying up your time at the moment? So, um, basically, a couple of years back our nation's broadcasters came together to sort of standardize and transition digital workflows. Now obviously this is all about FAR-based workflows and FAR-based program delivery. So they've taken some of the work done by the good people at AMWAL, MWA, the Advanced Media Workflow Association or something. Um, and they've taken some work they've done on long-form program contribution and applied a set of rules specific to the UK. Um, so they're looking to sort of bring in compulsory file delivery. Well, they will be on the 1st of October. So uh, all the manufacturers have been rushing to produce equipment that can produce this uh, sort of very specific type of file and all the associated metadata and QC practices that go with it. So we've sort of been implementing that and helping people get ready for FD day, as it's called, file delivery day. So. Uh, so that's what we're we're gearing up to. Our delivery standardised in the UK for the first time, and the whole of the world is watching what we're doing. So it's quite exciting. And obviously, obviously, um, uh, a content agent is is a method you can use to um, uh, generate those uh, those those um, AS11 um, uh, uh, files. Um, but uh, I'm, I've just got up on screen um, our, some videos from our recent platform one. Um, 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 event and obviously you did a little presentation there. Well, quite quite an extensive presentation about um, uh, about DPP deliverables, not just generating files, but also um, um, uh, how would you say uh, the QC process using um, uh, VidChecker. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fantastic. Okay. Um, it seems that we've all been to kind of events. Matt and I recently, with 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 Wesley, our trainee, we were recently at the um, uh, a, a, tr a training event put on by Nexan, who are a, a cable and parts manufacturer, and uh, that the, the, their push is very much for for, for for Cat8, which is this new cabling standard, which Matt's going to talk about in a little in a little bit. Um, uh, but I'm just going to talk about what we learned about the new techniques for fibre testing. Um, uh, for, 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 for lots of years, when we install fiber, we, we prefer to do spliced fiber. That's, we feel that's, for infrastructure cabling, that's the best way to go. Uh, lower loss and a more robust um, 
uh, you know, f- facilities, um, more flexible, you know, lower total cost of ownership. Essentially, spliced loose tube cable, once it's in, doesn't fail, whereas tight buffered cable often does. Um, and and the, typically the way we test, so, so the way you test for copper cabling is using something like this, and I'm just going to wave it in front of the camera, turn it on so we get a nice display on it, is um, a, a Fluke DTX tester. Now this is this is what we call a, uh, a an OTDR, a time division uh, reflectometer, and it's a very clever gadget that can that can you know send you know high frequency pulses down cables and make very involved measurements for everything you might want to measure about a copper cable, um, uh, ailing cross talk, uh, near end cross talk, lots of other things. But this this particular set, in fact, all the kind of high end you know more expensive than five thousand pound type testers come with removable heads. If I tug off this this is a cat 6a um what they call a a a, a channel adapter um for testing cat 6 infrastructure and you can put you can insert into the same hole a fiber uh, tester but truth to tell none of us really do um fiber testing uh with otdrs um because that's really for diagnosing faults on very long infrastructure very long sort of wide area network type cabling and rather that the sort of preferred method for, for for the type of fibers we install is using something like this which is a calibrated light source um uh, you know which which emits uh, laser at, uh, at the, the frequency you want to test at or the wavelength i should say we don't really talk about frequencies because they're so large when you're dealing with fiber um so so this this is a this is a multi-mode tester and this will uh, test at um uh, uh, 650, 850, and 980 nanometer wavelengths, and, and then at the other end you have a uh, you know a, a receiver, and, and that tells you just how lossy the link is. Um, now, up until now, uh, that's just been fine, but we've always known. In fact, all engineers who do sort of fiber testing have always known that there's something not quite right. We we get inconsistent readings, but but the inconsistencies have always been within. Um, uh, they've always been within the, 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 the tolerance of, of what we need for our, for our connection. So when we were working with OM1 fiber, 8 decibels of loss, 8 dBs of loss on a link was acceptable. Now we're kind of down at the sort of 2.5 dBs of loss. But as we move away from 10 gigabit, you know, OM3 type fiber, to OM4, which you know hopefully will bring kind of 40, 50 gigabit type speeds, we're looking at kind of sub... 2 dBs of loss on a circuit and and so then you really need a, a, a reading that's accurate and it's accurate between manufacturers of test equipment which currently we don't have you know there's as much as a dB of variance between different manufacturers and the reason for this is for this uh, is this phenomenon called um, uh, it's, very, it's a bit of a mouthful encircled flux loss uh, encircled flux loss happens when um, the LED emitter in, in, in the tester essentially overfills the fiber cable and so you've got high modes of light traveling down the cladding of the cable as well as the entire center core the data carrying core of the fiber being full of light as well now if you've got a, a you know a high a high-end single mode application with a proper laser launch device that just literally fills the core of the cable but when you're using V cells and, and LED emitters which are more common in kind of the commodity equipment we tend to sell you know the sort of 200 pound you know fiber channel card or the sort of 60 pound SFP that goes in your switch they more likely to use an LED or at the or very best a, a, a V cell a, a, which is a solid state laser a vertical a vertical cavity surface emitting laser they tend to overfill the fiber now that's fine if you're just transmitting data and you want to get the best out of the fiber but if you want to test the fiber you really need to use something that um, fills the fiber to a well-defined in a well-defined fashion and and so far you know the kind of um, testers that I, I sort of held up to the camera a minute ago they don't do that and their manufacturers are only starting to bring in uh, testers that can do that um, and so this there's, there's a couple of sort of semi-approved methods of, of sort of taming your launch fiber so that um, you, you don't overfill the fiber under test. You can use a launch cable that's specifically manufactured, and it's quite an expensive piece, but specifically manufactured to um, not overfill the fiber under test. Uh, there's these things called mandrels, <laughs> which are bizarre kind of cotton reel type affairs, which you wrap your launch cable around, and uh, it, it will... Um, uh, it, it will it will dissipate those high order modes of light from the cladding of the fiber before it gets put into the fiber under test. Or, or, or there are mode conditioning patch cords which you can use if you're doing what they call a a three cable test, um, which is not really the way we test cables. It's much more prominent in data centers. Um, but it's kind of an interesting thing that uh, you, you know as as we move more and more towards 40 and 56 gig fiber, um, and and presumably even higher because we use fiber 
to a tiny degree of what it's capable of. It's always the equipment at each end of the circuit that is the limitation. As we move more and more towards those higher data rates, uh, our testers are, are, are being found to be you know, not adequate and not accurate enough. So uh, I thought that, for me, that was, that was the, like a very interesting aspect that came out of that training day. And these things are fantastic when, when a manufacturer is willing to sort of like put on a day and hire a hotel suite and, and feed you and then give you loads of good information. And, and the other side of that was, was the copper side of it and, and, and you know, Cat8 and, and all that. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that's what Matt's going to talk about now. Okay, um, well, uh, trying not to uh, go too far in depth with Cat8 and just uh, talk about the sort of big takeaways, because obviously, um, obviously uh, you can't buy Cat8 right now. It, it won't be available till the end of the year. And the reality is, is um, Cat8, you know, a 40 g base T solution, um, there's no silicon that can drive it yet. They're just talking about what it's going to look like. But, but given that the, the cabling has been pretty much standardized, um, I, I, I'll just talk about some of the big takeaways, really, from, from what CAD8 is. Now, I'll start with a bit of confusion about nomenclature, which is really relevant because there are, there are going to be two types of CAT8 infrastructure. Um, so everyone's familiar pretty much with, uh, certainly up to CAT5e and CAT6, everything looks fairly sensible. We know that, that you know, CAT5e, CAT6 for, for basic gigabit infrastructure, the idea was with CAT6, we might be able to, um, to, to get a bit more and, and to maybe get up to um, 10 G base T but of course, then we came across problems with alien cross talk at those speeds. So Cat 6A was ratified, and then Cat 7 came along. Now the big problem with Cat 7 um, is that it was never ratified by the TIA um, in in the US. So so Cat 7 is very much a European thing, and and it isn't really a a, a category per se. Um, because it, it's known as class F and class G, I believe. Uh, and just get Phil showing some interesting, uh, interesting uh, Wikipedia pages which details this. So yeah, the, the class F and class FA, which is the CAT7, was never ratified in the US. Um, but class F and class FA um, provide a much more shielding of the, the conductors as well as a better cable geometry. Um, and basically allowed us to get up to 100 meters at 10, 10 gig base T um, without large alien crosstalk testing. Because what was found, if you want a CAT6, you wanted a CAT6 solution ratified for 10 gig and tested to guarantee 10 gig performance, you'd have to provide this alien crosstalk testing, which involved testing pairs around the cable you were wanting to test and how much was getting from cable to cable. Obviously, that ended up so expensive that it's not really practical to install. So, so Cat Seven doesn't really exist in the K in the States. That's very much a European thing, and so the the US is is, is pretty much going to jump along with the rest of the world to the Cat Eight standards. Now, this is relevant because there are two types of Cat Eight infrastructure going in. Um, there's going to be what's known as class 1 and class 2 cat 8. The cables are going to be very similar um, but they are going to be slightly different and the connectors are going to be different and basically the class 1 cat 8 is going to be an evolution of the class 6a standard um, pretty much insisted on by the TIA, the American Standards Body and the class 2 solution is going to be um, much more of a development of the Class 7A standard. They're both aiming for the same sort of analog bandwidth and performance, but um, uh, they, they're aiming for the same analog bandwidth and performance, but, but in reality, the Class 2 infrastructure is going to give you a little bit more headroom and a little bit more leeway um, with regards to crosstalk and end crosstalk because it's a little bit, it's better shielded. Now, as Phil uh, maybe mentioned earlier, there, there's a new connector involved in the in the well, it's the Class 7A connectors, which is known as the GG45. 
and, and Phil is very helpfully showing us a, a picture there of the GG45 connectors against RJ45s or 8P8C if you want to give it its, its correct term. The GG45 uh, connector, if, if you look very closely uh, at the connectors there, you'll see an extra four pins. So it's a 12 pin connector. And, and what this allows us to do is to split out, if you think about an RJ45 connector, the internal two pairs are, are interleaved. And that introduces crosstalk into those four pairs. So what the GG45 connector is there are an extra four pairs, and more sensibly, um, the, the female uh, receptacle can um, identify whether an RJ45 or a GG45 has been plugged in and switch its receiving pairs to these other ones, which isolate all four of the pairs and give you a much better crosstalk figure. So, so, so the thing to, to remember about GG45 infrastructure is is that it is backwards compatible, but obviously if you use an RJ45 into a GG45 receptacle, you are losing your 40 gig um, capability. Now the other thing with class 8.1 that I think we really have to be clear for people is it's not going to be a flood wiring solution. It is, it is, it is designed for data centers. It is going to be limited at 30, 40 meters maximum run length. Um, there is, it is not going to be like back in the day when Cat6 came along, you know, anyone sensible if they were flood wiring a premises would just say, right, I'm just going to use Cat6, that's going to keep me future proof for, for 10 years. The reality is, is Cat8 is, is only a backbone technology, it's a data center technology. So we don't advise people start thinking, I'm building a new facility, I've got to put Cat8 everywhere. If you really need uh, more than one gig to the desktop, um, then the solution is still Cat7A running 10 gig base T. Um, th th there is no way that, the, uh, th that your Cat8 is ever going to be ratified for longer distances. It's just not physically capable of getting the 40 gig over copper with reasonable power consumption, that kind of distance. So that's a big takeaway. Don't think new standard, I want to flood wire my facility with the new standard and that will make me future proof. And if you need more than 10 gig to the desktop, you're looking at a fiber solution. And that's pretty much, you know, welcome to physics. You know, we need to, uh, to, 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 to observe the rules of the real world. So, I mean, I mean, those are the basic sort of takeaways of what CAT8 is. Um, uh, the 40 gig, I don't know when the roadmap for the silicon for, for being able to push 40 gig on copper is looking at. The cables and connectors will be in production by the end of the year um, when we will, you know, know real, a little bit more about what, what sort of the cost determination is going to be over and above your average CAT6. Um, obviously, patch leads are manufactured. You can't manufacture patch leads, but um, but but uh, sort of socket to socket infrastructure. We'll know what the manufacturing cost will be when we see when we see uh, hardware, um, which will be the end of the year. And and there's a push. A lot of people have rubbished uh, Cat8 in conversations I've had, suggesting that you know, 10 gig over copper is such a uh, inefficient from a power perspective um, uh, and, and you know 40 gig is going to be significantly more so um, I think there's a significant effort going into making sure that, that the actual power uh, needed to get this sort of data rate down the cable is going to be much much more modest than, than the 10 gig um, so those are the pretty much the, uh, the big takeaways I don't know if anyone has any questions about that or I mean you know we're talking about cables obviously there's much more uh, intelligent shielding and much more comprehensive shielding of each individual pair as well as the overall screen to try and get you know this kind of performance and we're looking at the analog performance is definitely going to be a minimum of 1600 uh, megahertz so 1.6 gigahertz down each pair in the, in the analog domain um, but, but what they're actually aiming for is two gigahertz performance damage cable, which you think about, you know, 
the lengths we go to with uh, with analog with video um, infrastructure. That's a significant amount of data down a down a twisted path. Who's um who's driving the, the the technology? Is it the switch manufacturers or the uh, the industry, or you know, who's who's pushing for uh, the it's, new standards? The hardware manu the hardware manufacturers are driving it, like all these standards. You know, they want to sell everyone more, yeah, more, more infrastructure, and they 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 obviously it helps them if they can sell product which is interoperable rather than you know yep. exclusively say forty gig has to be on fiber. If you could put your backbone in copper and then put use the same infrastructure for 40 gig and for 1 gig and for 10 gig within the data center, it, it gives them better economies of scale. See, I, I think I think two different types of manufacturers driving this. That uh, all the all the sort of um, promotional material I've seen for Cat8. You know, the second paragraph, the first paragraph is always about data centers. The second paragraph is always about domestic applications for HDMI 2 and things like that. So I think they, mm -hmm. have, they have another eye on, on domestic installers being able to install this for extending 4K video over home networks. Um, okay. The, the, the other person I was hoping would join us today, he hasn't, is Rupert and, and Mellanox, their new range of switches that we, sh we, that we saw um, exhibited at um, Platform One. And I think we're starting to build a little bit of a relationship with Mellanox in terms of being the, uh, an official supplier. Um, their new range of switches are all uh, 40 stroke 56 gig port based. And then a port can then be weighing down to, I think, a port can be a single 40 stroke 56 gig. That standard hasn't been ratified, but the, apparently the back plane can handle both. Uh, uh, or, or a port could be you, can, you have a breakout adapter that gives you four 10 gig e-ports or another kind of breakout adapter that gives you 10 1 gig ports so so the, the switches are very flexible and they have this sort of proprietary connector that, that you then break out to the networking standard you want to work with um, so um, I think I think it's it's that that's very sort of high end media shared storage type solution that, that you know that we do and there's also that sort of almost quite low end domestic um, we want to send HDMI and things like that over this kind of cable as well. Just jumping into the, to that domestic conversation, obviously um, from a general purpose use, um, with each individual pair being screened as well as the overall jacket screen and, a, and, a, and an impedance of, of um, 100 ohms, um, the cable type for, for domestic or even for general purpose wiring is much more useful if you think in terms of if you want to get full balanced audio with an individual screen down a cable or AES. I'd love to see what AES will do. Phil's laughing because I mentioned audio. Um, <laughs> everything comes back to audio with me, I'm afraid. Um, but if you wanted to get AES down it, or, or, or even uh, people are talking about balance to send 75 video down a, a balanced screen CAD 8 pair. You know, you're going to get a lot of flexibility you know, and a lot less trade-offs than you would in another equivalent cable. So it may well be very useful as a generic cable type. We'll have to see what happens in that space. Happy days. Um, just staying with the networking thing, but very much lower end. Um, this is my little quick tip. Uh, these little gadgets, you must—I mean, you've seen them on Amazon. They're like sort of twenty quid. It's a little, just a little plug-in router, and it's got—it's—it's um, it, it's a wireless gadget, and it's got two Ethernet ports. It can either be LAN and WAN, so there's a little firewall in here, so it can—it can isolate a network segment from another network segment, or it can be a little switch along with the wireless. And that, in fact, this one's even got a little shared storage. Um, you know, plug your thumb drive in there and share it on your network kind of thing or charge your iPhone. Uh, and the thing I use this for, and it comes in really handy, is demos. So if I need to create a tiny little network just to say demo Amulet and I need two network ports and I need to be able to get in using my laptop over the wireless, this just fits the bill, perfect. I don't have to trouble the client to use their network. Um, if I'm doing training and I need to put a, a Tektronix waveform monitor at the back of the room where the projector input is, uh, then I can put the Tektronix on the same wireless network as my laptop, again controlling it. Or if I'm if we're at a at a at a premises doing wiring and the wiremen all want internet access on their iPhones, but the customer's not happy to give it to us, I can get onto their network using a wired port and reshare it over the wireless. So this is a fantastic little gadget to keep in your rucksack, in your bag, um, for just sort of general um, you know, engineering goodness. Top tip. 
top tip here. So, so, so nobody's saying anything. So here's my next top tip. I mean, you, you all remember these gadgets, don't you? A, a, a Dender. So this is a, an RS232 oh, yeah. to RS42 adapter. And in fact, you also get, they also do like a cable variant. So this is exactly the same thing, but it's USB um, and uh, RS422 at the other end. Um, and uh, you know, this is because we use workstations to control VTRs. You know, you get those with Avids. Um, oh, but if it's a, if it's a more modern computer that doesn't have a serial port, you obviously have to have a USB version of it. Um, now, I occasionally have to prove an RS four two two connection. I have to prove that it's working. Although we're still, you, you know, yeah, VTRs have pretty much gone the way of the dinosaur. There's still a lot of things that use um, RS four two two. You know, server ports. Um, um, uh, you know, MAMs will quite often control server ports over 422. In studios, vision mixers and effects machines quite often talk to each other timeline P2 protocol over 422. And so I, there's occasionally I need a quick and dirty way to control an RS-422 gadget. And um, uh, so with one of those things, just the right settings in Windows to make sure, you know, your port's set up correctly. Um, and um, uh, and a little bit of VTR control software. I don't know if you, do you remember some of the freebies they used to offer on, on Addenda's website. You might remember this little gadget. Still runs under Windows, even though it's a really old bit of wow. software. So with that on your laptop, even runs on a virtual machine on my laptop, because I, I, I'm, I'm rocking a Mac, so, so I just run it inside Parallels. And, and this uh, gadget, let me switch back to my camera. Um, and I, I can I can just test um, um, you know using one of those I can just test uh, VTR control even if I because you, you might know that a 422 link is operated is correctly wired but you often have to prove that a, that something at the other end is answering P2 protocol it's behaving itself so that's my second little top tip of the day. <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's all about being prepared, my brothers. <laughs> so if nobody, if nobody else is saying anything I'm going to do my third top tip of the day um, so okay. if you've ever been in a situation where a recently installed um, black magic router has caused a, 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 a Nexan you know an SNFS type SAN to misbehave his oh what's that Skeggs have you been in that situation <laughs> yes <laughs> go on tell us a bit what, 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 what no. didn't happen it's about the ports, isn't it? It is, yeah. So, so it, by, by horrible coincidence, and how does this happen? Blackmagic's yeah. um, root control software runs by default over over that port there, nine 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 zero. Which it's hey, because there's not that many ports around, isn't it? You see, so they have to. Well, there's uh, only there's only yeah, six, not, sixty five thousand of them. <laughs> and, and then they look at who uses what ports in their industry, and then choose one. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's done it's malicious, isn't it? How can you most mess up an engineer on site? I, I I don't know if it's if it's um if it's easy to do under uh, under the Stornex file system. If it's easy to change the metadata comms port, um, is it DS? <laughs> It's easier to change this port. Exactly, yeah. So it's it's trivial to do <laughs> in the Blackmagic um, control software. It's trivial to go and to go and change the port number. Just make sure you've got the current version of the Blackmagic software, and you can instruct the router to listen out on port nine 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 one or nine nine eight nine if you so so desired, and uh, set all your clients to do the same thing, and all your hardware control panels, and you'll be good. And you, your 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 cheapest chips Blackmagic router can exist with your expensive as diamonds uh, DVS SAN or whatever. Whatever other Stornex uh, storage you've got, Xan or whatever. Top tip, that's a good one. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, moving swiftly along, if nobody else wants to chip in, I've just got one more thing I wanted to share with you guys today. There's, there's one quite interesting thing in, uh, if seeing as we're talking about, very briefly touched on, I've got. Um, sort of driving change with IP, uh, IP technology and stuff. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff been published this week about um, BBC trialling IP studios for the Commonwealth Games, um, using virtual studios over uh, for UHD video over uh, over IP technologies that the BBC R and D have been developing, such as Stagebox. So that's sort of worth a read, and there's quite a lot about on sort of the BBC R and D website about that at the moment. So it's worth worth a read if you're into, interested in that sort of thing and where the future is going there. You can't you can't say virtual studio bill without filling in the details a little bit there. All right. Well, I'm, I haven't done that much. It's Apache knowledge, I have to say, but. Um, 
Yes, they're sort of. Uh, so essentially, it's looking like Sony and Grass Valley are sort of developing these directly connected IP cameras. But at the moment, they've got um, they take sort of four SDI feeds um, directly into a multi-core PC, so sort of one per camera, um, which is loaded with an I/O card for sort of processing the video. It's uh, a quad Quadrus card from memory. There we go, and. Um, so that's sort of what Stagebox does, which is BBC's, uh, what they've been developing, which I think is going to be commercially available very soon. Um, and then, yes, they send that over, I think, but if, uh, it was an existing sort of Virgin Media broadband, 100 gig interface spanning a Virgin Media broadband link. Uh, and, they, and then from there, my knowledge of the, the quite what's going on gets... Uh, gets a bit flaky, but it's all quite exciting, and it seems to be sort of, uh, have lots of exciting abilities to sort of be able to separate various elements and streams within the, uh, you know, S audio essence feeds and video essence feeds and route them in uh, new and exciting ways, so have a, have a read of that. It is That's the perennial problem. It is a perennial problem, isn't it? That, that in live TV production, you need, you know, as a field of video leaves the camera, um, you know, it has to be at the vision mixer in a predictable fashion. And, and, and obviously yeah. over, over coaxial cable, um, you, you know, the, the longest you can run uh, 3G over coax is, you know, kind of 60, 70, 80 metres reliably, and then you into fibre. But even then, you don't really run fibre more than about a kilometre for, for, for camera feeds. Uh, and, and, the, and then you're only really talking about, you know, hundreds of pixels worth of delay. You're not talking about fields or frames worth of delay, which is what IP throws into the mix. And so traditionally, um, it's been very hard to make the case for... Uh, IP video in live environments. Obviously, it's it's, it's entirely appropriate for post production environments or delivery environments as well. But uh, it's it's the one area outside broadcasting studios where where we haven't been able to kind of really make much sense of IP. Uh, and in fact, Matt and I uh, spend a lot of our time have done over the last couple of months fiddling around with Antrica and um, you know HDSDI over uh, network gadgets and and you know, work, you know along with the Amulet KVM over IP system that we sell that we love so much. We're hoping to show a sensible set of kind of proposals to customers about LAN and WAN operation of remote AVID workstations. But the thing, um, the only thing that tickled my fancy from the um, Beyond HD Masters Day, uh, which was a month and a half ago now, was Sony's um, uh, live IP system. They've got one product that you can buy today, the NXL IP55. So let's just stick a picture of that up on screen. And um, this is... So, so the guy from Sony... Um, was there very much to make the point that in the same way that Sony established the SDI standard back in the early 90s, um, and they, in fact, it was considered controversial at the time because at the time it was standards bodies like the EBU and, and the uh, ATSC and people like that who specified signal standards. Uh, and, and the previous digital video standard, uh, yeah, REC601, which actually uh, the connector style, uh, a REC656 connector, was a, was a, was a D25 uh, parallel digital video connector. And it was Sony who, who, who serialized that and made serial digital video a success. Uh, and in the same way, the, 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 the guy on the Sony stand was very much saying that um, Sony now wants to provide the next standard for, for IP AV type work and this system they've got here uses a proprietary Sony codec so nobody really knows what it does um, I'm sure it's it's still um, a discrete cosine based transform codec um, because all the proprietary Sony video compression codecs like you found in HD cam and such have been like that but this gives a guaranteed single field of delay so an almost tolerable amount of delay you know ideally video people would like no delay or just pixels of delay between the camera and the output of the vision mixer but this is a system that provides uh, a guaranteed single field of delay which is you can deal with that um, uh, through a network system and so if I if I stick up um, the diagram you can see typically you might have four cameras at one end one of these um, NXL IP55 transceivers at the at the um, <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe in, in, in the venue, and then just through a single gigabit Ethernet connection, you can get all of those video feeds, and they pop out as proper HDSDI, you know, 1920, 1080, and um, 422 color space video back to a vision switcher. So very much integrating an IP workflow into a traditional live broadcast television workflow. Um, 
And they've got some variations on this. At the moment, the box will do four streams of video, and it doesn't care which way they go. They can go in or out, and it supports uh, you know, an associated serial connection for each video so that you can have camera controls. You can control the lens, you can control the colorimetry of the camera from the remote end. So very much what the, the Rax engineer, very much what the um, director of photography would expect in the OB van or in the studio. Um, and there's also, you know, you can have like three videos coming from the venue and one video going back to the venue as a, as a return feed for the, for the um, you know, preview monitors or whatever. Uh, and, um, and at the moment, that's all it does. But they're promising extensions to this that will allow them to move their 4K pictures. And then you'd need a 10 gig connection. Uh, but, um, you know, it's a modest six to one compression. So this the kind of thing you get, you know, on, on Sony VTRs, you know, SR, HDCAM SR. Um, and it seems to be, I, I mean, I've, I've heard that, that um, um, Everts have got something similar to offer, but I've, I've yet to see any documentation related to that, whether it's available to buy. There's the back of the, uh, of the, of the Sony box. And these are kind of $10,000 each, so, so it's an expensive little thing to play with. But, you know, if, if all you can get between the venue where you're doing your OB or your studio shit, whatever, and, and the control room, is a single gigabit connection. Then this is this is this works today. And and the thing I didn't mention is that there's um, there's audio for the intercom in and out, and there's tally lights, you know, to to, to light the red light, red lights on the camera, and um, the control port here breaks out further into the four serials for the cameras for racks control and things like that. And then you've got your uh, your, your HDSDI with embedded, um, and and it'll take it'll take um, standard definition, um, you know, tri sync or bi sync references as well, so you can you can reference. Um, the cameras also. So it's, it's exactly what OB and studio people need for, um, you know, a proper studio shoot. But at the same time, um, it, it brings us uh, back to um, we're doing it over a network connection. That's kind of Is interesting. This the I one thought. that they trialled with the um, German football league. Uh, yeah, that's right. That, 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 in fact, we, we saw quite a nice video from Sonny, um, Sonny uh, Deutschland um, uh, at the show uh, showing exactly them doing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of people have watched it and the consensus is pictures are brilliant. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not a problem at all. Do you need to set up QoS in the switch, in the Ethernet switches either side to get the, uh, the high performance? I don't know. I suspect you probably need a very, very flat network. Uh, you know, yeah, if it has to go through anything that does packet, you know, shaping or whatever. Dedicated switches, I think they had from memory. That would make sense. Which kind of takes the edge off it, I guess. Yeah, the point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Because it is an entirely UDP system, so, so um, you know it's uh, it just it just I'm, I'm sure it just saturates the Ethernet link, and, uh, and yeah. if it was going through a switch, you'd have to have a switch that doesn't do port blocking, for example. So, so, so nothing. If, if it's Cisco, can't be more than about a year old. <laughs> <laughs> and I presume you need shallow buffers as well, or else it's going to uh, start playing havoc with it. Buffer bloat is the uh, is the curse of the industry, isn't it? Right, gents, I've got to disappear, so uh, I'll leave you. Uh, thank you very much. Lovely to see you, Captain Skeggs, and we'll uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Catch you later. Cheers, bye. Take it easy. <laughs> Flipping heck, that's noisy. Who's making all that noise? Thing is, the the lorry is passing by Route Six Development Office. Oh, fantastic! It's a it's a, it's a nice day in Soho today, isn't it? It's a it's a lovely day here yeah. at the workshop. It is very hot. You've got to have the windows open, otherwise you're it's sweaty. Okay, yeah. so um, I've um, I've shot my load. I've I've said all the things I wanted to say. Is is there anything else uh, you chaps wanted to bring? To, to the session in general. Yes, yeah. I mean, given that we've got we've got nobody else from outside Route 6 joining us today. Yeah, yeah. We've got 20 minutes left. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. So uh, we were at the DPP uh, Manufacturers Interoperability Day, as I sort of alluded to earlier. Skeggs was there as well with uh, DVS's offering, um, Venice, and I was there with our, our own offering, which is Route 6 Technologies Content Agent. So um, Content Agent is a workflow, is our own workflow engine. So obviously that includes elements of transcoding and stuff. But as a UK uh, UK based company, we thought it'd be prudent to really take on the challenge of a DPP workflow from end to end. So that's sort of what's taken up a lot of our challenge, uh, a lot of our time recently. But um, 
No, it's a really interesting day. Uh, so things that were sort of covered are uh, the DPP compliance lab was sort of the big topic of the day. So um, the DPP aimed to sort of have a cert in collaboration with AMWA, aimed to have a certification standard in place where uh, people can actually say that their product is DPP compliant. And the idea is that product can producing DPP compliant files, another product that is a play out um, product or a, a reader, as it were, is guaranteed to be able to understand those DPP compliant files on the other side. So it's sort of split into uh, two very crude groups, the uh, the DPP makers and the DPP readers. And they're, um, there's a certain amount of crossover between the two. So um, the DPP have set up a lab. Uh, with sort of the help of BBC R&D and a few other um, manufacturers, which remain secret. And um, <laughs> they, they run their own sort of custom scripts, amongst other things. And uh, they, they will run tests and they'll say, OK, you're good and you've either, well, either you failed and you need this what you need to correct or you passed with a condition. And that's something that you are DPP certified, but there's little sort of niggly things that you might want to look at correcting for a future version of software. And uh, and then there's a full pass. Um, so yeah, so that was all very interesting and all the... So this is this is very um, much stuff about, about sort of making sure that codex syntax is correct and, and, and things yeah, like that, absolutely. yeah? Yeah, so codex and KLV text. structure is right and all this kind of thing. KLV, your yeah, your material top package is in the right place. Sorry, your file, your material top package description, whatever, all in the right place um, and describing the right things. Yeah, I mean, we it's sort of you've got to applaud the DPP because this is stuff that's sort of really this is edge case scenario stuff now. So there were sort of eight or nine manufacturers there and we all traded files and no one really had an interoperability issue with another another um, another supplier so everyone was playing back everyone else's files that they'd made um, pretty much and all the commodity uh, all the co sort of commo off the shelf available QC products so your VidChecker and your Seravis were all happy with um, the files that people were producing so I mean the work that so from that sort of element everyone is sort of very interoperable which leaves us in a great place for um for October there were some notable people sort of missing from the exercises such as uh, Sony and Avid and I imagine that's sort of because they're pouring over the the legal paperwork that comes with signing up for the DPP lab and the compliance procedure D don't you think but um I'm sorry go do you think that people like Sony and Avid will always be a little bit behind that because, I mean, at a crude level, who who wants to do DPP encoding and checking on their media composer? That's that's in the expensive room. That's the expensive workstation that you don't want yeah. to be doing that kind of little utility operation, isn't it? I mean, I have yeah. That's always the argument we push, and more and more people are sort of a lot of people are sort of done towing the water DPP deliverables from their Avid suite. First of all, um, we did have one feedback from one facility that their clients actually. They sort of didn't believe it being made by something else. They wanted to see um, at the, the Avid making the final deliverable and then playing it out again. Um, unfortunately, until a recent version, Avid had an issue sort of playing back other manufacturers' AS11 DPP files. And this again goes back to the sort of syntax structure. Um, it's since been rectified, but that sort of sort of isolated, I certainly feel Avid in terms of producing their. Uh, their AS11 files, um, so they were, you know, checking them back and making them within within Avid. But yeah, more and more people are sort of wanting to move the process out and by passing on like an AAF or a QuickTime reference to a product which understands them, like Content Agent and um, the gold standard them. for DPP deliverables. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, it was all very promising it was all there was all a high degree of interoperability there um, so these are really things that the DPP are checking now in sort of that yeah exactly like the bytes are in the right place so that if something wasn't quite sure where your audio tracks were meant to be they knew exactly where they were even though it could rely on the, the layout so yeah it was all a very interesting day um, and we're sort of seeing a move 
towards a, a more interoperable standard. I think it's interesting that, 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 that obviously DPP for a lot of people has has brought loudness to the fore and it also yep. seems to have brought PSE to the fore as well. I've, I've always had a little bit of an interest in PSE and we talked about it a bit in, our, in one of our previous um, Ask Us Anythings. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. You know, you sort of play the, um, uh, pl- play the, the famous um, uh, Pokemon clip and uh, put it full screen on a projector and get everybody to stare at it and see, see who sort of starts to uh, feel a bit twitchy, but nobody ever does. <laughs> But um, the, the the thing that's sort of bemused me a tiny bit about the DPP um, spec for PSC is that I rather hoped they would just say um, deliver it to the Ofcom spec, um, and 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 that way it doesn't then give a, a preferential market position to Harding, which Harding's managed to carve out for himself very much over the last ten years. Um, you know, people say we have to have it tested to the Harding standard, not to the DPP standard. And Harding, as we know, tests a bunch of extra things, regular patterning and stuff like this, which has never been part of the Ofcom specification. However, um, the DPP spec doesn't say just test the Ofcom spec. It says test to whatever spec these various fine manufacturers define and tell us what you tested to and what version of the algorithm you tested to. So in a sense, it's better than just saying Harding because now we've got a choice of tech, Digimetrix Aurora, Baton, uh, VidChecker, etc. Um, but it's almost like they're, they're, they've, they've resisted saying the Ofcom spec is adequate, test to the Ofcom spec. It's almost like they're saying um, test to one of these specs and just tell us that you did it. Um, which seems like a you know a strange thing to do in terms of PSC. I don't know. I don't know why they've taken that attitude. Yeah. Well, I think there's a certain amount now that um, obviously the the in the, the key, this this sort of QC element was more traditionally done by a broadcaster in a lot of a uh, lot of environments, but now the onus is really pushed back onto the content producer um, to verify that their content's okay and that it does things like pass PSE and loudness. And I think, I, I still think, yeah, that maybe there's an element of nervousness there when they're covering, you know, they, they at least can cover themselves with these devices they know are, know are correct until the day comes where people are properly interpreting the Ofcom spec. And I, think, I don't know. Well, maybe, That's, maybe they're just worried about annoying uh, Harding. <laughs> Maybe that Mr. Harding on his island. Yeah, <laughs> with his with his white his white cat. <laughs> white cat. Yes, exactly. I I think. Sorry to come in there, guys, but yeah. I think a very interesting point here. A couple of conversations with some smaller production facilities that we've been having. Um, just to reiterate, the the that it is not okay. Um, Although the um, the QC requirements are being pushed back much more to production facilities, and and in my experience of, of being involved in in a facility, um, you tended to try and make sure you'd done your own QC passes before it went to a broadcaster. Anyway, that was certainly hard because the cost of fixing at the last minute because a broadcaster has rejected something is a lot more expensive than making sure it's right before it goes to QC at the broadcaster. But 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 just there, there there has been a perception in a couple of places I've been recently to to suggest that DPP and automated QC, you know, when you create the DPP package, is is going to eliminate the need for real world uh, eyes on screens QC, and and we have to stress very clearly that yeah. that, that automated QC can check a number of things. But it isn't necessarily going to pick up on a number of errors that can happen in the production process, whether that's unclear audio, which, you know, there's been recent instances of a broadcaster transmitting unclear dialogue uh, due to basically what comes down to bad acting and production, which um, which no automated QC is going to pick up on. Or, or bad images, or bad aspect ratio conversion, all of these kinds of things just aren't going to get picked up in an automated QC procedure. And you still need to be doing your, your, you know, somebody not involved with the production in front of a monitor, listening, looking, and, and, and qualifying it as good to go out, checking for spelling mistakes, etc. 
Yes, it's going to be a long, long time, isn't it, before um, before any software can detect badly spelled lower thirds or or profanity in the audio track and things things like that. The things that you traditionally yeah. need, you know, your um, uh, good quality, um, uh, you know, QC operator to be keeping eyeballs on. Um, there's just one. Well, there's a little clip I want to direct everybody towards. In fact, my, my Firefox has just crashed, so uh, so so I'm, I'm gonna have to open that up again. But um, uh, Simon Brett, who's now facilities manager at NBC Universal, good good friend of Route Sixes, um, uh, also has worked at um, um, National Geographic, Fox Channels. In fact, we've done a lot of work for him uh, in his role there, and. Um, uh, he was presenting at a Route 6 event a couple of months ago now, and I don't remember what we called that event. What, Stepping Stones, was that what it was called, Stepping. Bill? Were, were yeah, you there? Yeah, sort of. I was there. I did my, got up and did my turn. Um, it was, yeah, it was Stepping Stones, so it was sort of um, designed to be more directed at the production community. So it's a sort of a, a gentle introduction and a breakdown of why we do things, so sort of a more through the specification than obviously Simon gave us some real world experience. So a less technically minded and more practical approach to the DPP was the event. Yeah, um, I have to yeah. say, watching watching his video, which is only 15 minutes long, and it really is worth a watch, it struck me that here's somebody who isn't a technologist, who isn't a, a technology manager, um, uh, but, but but who actually is doing this already, you know, and, and, and in those 15 minutes of his presentation, I got more than I've seen on most of the, the sort of technologists presenting at DPP open days. Um, so I encourage everybody to go and uh, go and take a look at that. It's, it's on Route 6's YouTube channel. It's on my yeah. blog as well. Um, and uh, Simon's an engaging speaker for quite a, quite a good speaker as well. Quite, quite, you know, he's good value. Yeah, the uh, the other thing, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And the other thing is, um, I think a lot of these sort of panels and technologists and sort of experts, they sort of actually, for the majority of the people, making the AS11 file is not the difficult bit. And that's sort of up to us, the manufacturers. And we're nearly there to make sure that making the actual file itself is easy. It's the sort of new workflow practices and handling the metadata and the the quality control processes and thinking about the, the actual workflow itself that's difficult. And I, there's not actually a huge amount of guidance out there. It all sounds very simple when someone describes it, but sort of in practice, it's actually, yeah, difficult. And that's something that Simon's obviously got experience in and his speech alludes to that. So yeah, worth a watch. Okay, well, listen, chaps, uh, we're just hitting an hour now, so I thank you, and um, it's a shame we didn't get a few more people along, but I think we've, we've banged on about some good subjects, and, yeah. uh, you know, no doubt in the next sort of two or three weeks we'll have a bunch more of extra things to talk about. So, if you're watching this on the YouTube archive, uh, which is where we stick all these things after the event, uh, please uh, feel free to um, uh, hook us up, join us uh, through your Google account, uh, Route 6 Limited, R O T number 6 LTD is our Google account, and that's our YouTube ID as well and, uh, and and we'd love to talk to industry colleagues on the next one so thank you very much Mr Matt Ward you're welcome thank you and thank you very much Mr Bill Baker over and out and thank, very, you. thank you very much to Mr Dave Skeggs and all those other people who bailed at the last moment you know who you are <laughs>